what I figured and what has been my approach from the start has been if I produce a quality product first and a pretty product second, it'll go further. Because I know people who have mine eyes from when I was 15, 16, you know, they're a number of years old now. And the, they say to this day, they hold an edge great. They sharpen it a couple times a year at the most. And they're still happy with it. Now I look at those and they were nowhere near as pretty in my opinion as I can do now. But um, I know other people on the flip side who chose poor materials, worked the poor materials poorly. Again, this is just in my opinion. And it may have been really pretty, but the people who go to use them end up setting them on the shelf more than using them. And I would say that's one of the biggest things that I've tried to do to set my work apart is just try to keep it the quality and it being a functional tool yeah. first. Um, let's see, other things that went through my mind. Um, one thing that went through my mind a few years ago, I think it's been a few years, we don't have a TV, but I know of the TV show called Forged in Fire. And I remember, I remember around when that really became popular. And I remember seeing how much it's hurt those who actually do blacksmithing. Because now, everyone knows what an anvil is. Everyone knows what a blower is. And there are people who have very fast resources, who are willing to pay huge prices. And in general, it has skyrocketed the price for blacksmithing tools. I, f I saw the, the prices yeah, go yeah. up. Because oh, yeah, I was did. really getting into it, looking for my first anvil and that kind of thing. Um, when that happened, like the, the first... Yeah, the, this anvil, it's not much different than that, but I was thankful to find that for almost four times as much as I got that one for. Yeah. Or my parents got that one. That was the first one I started with. And I don't think that's going to be long term. I think it's going to, I think the, the rise is going to fall soon. Yeah. When people realize, like you were saying, the huge amount of muscle memory it takes and practice just hours, sometimes frustrating hours at the forge to learn how to swing that hammer exactly how you want. When people realize what it takes, um, they're going to start realizing, you know, I don't think I need this thing anymore. And I think in a little while, all those tools that have just been sapped yeah. up by people saying, I want to do that. I saw it on TV. I think those tools are going to start coming yeah. back out. I don't again. know. I, just I'm, my I'm trying not opinion. to be too optimistic. I don't know how. Um, I don't know if it'll be a huge flood, but I mean, I've already seen it. I've seen lots of listings online. Facebook Marketplace or wherever, okay. where people are selling their whole kit, and they usually want a crazy amount of money for it. But it, you know, it's it's usually sometimes a decent anvil and a lot of really like low quality mm -hmm. tools to surround it. But they're they're selling out. But um, I will say this: go. I yeah. think I will say this. I think that one thing that a lot of us overlook when we complain about the the uh, the prices of these tools is that um, as they've gotten more valuable, fewer of these really awesome, not being made anymore, 100-year-old anvils, vices, blowers, whatever, mm -hmm. fewer of them are getting scrapped. Mm -hmm. And that's something we've got to remember and um, is that, you know, yeah. as, as much as we begrudge the, um, the high prices and everybody thinking that their anvil's made of gold, <laughs> And, and also, I see people yep. <laughs> getting annoyed with um, collectors mm -hmm. who are just collecting lots and lots. Hundreds sometimes, yeah. And, um, but the truth is, that collector's going to die at some point. Mm -hmm. His collection's going to get dispersed. But collectors and high prices save tools. True. And that's, totally that's something I begrudgingly admit. But it mm -hmm. is like, you know, if you care about the stuff, you should also be thankful that it's not getting scrapped. I That's still see true. stuff getting scrapped, and I still see people finding amazing stuff, even anvils and vices, in the scrapyards, and that's just, that's heartbreaking to me. <laughs> yep, yep, I've, I've found, I've been blessed to find a few of those treasures here and there. Yeah. But yeah, you think about what goes on across the country as far as what gets scrapped, you just wish you could have an eye on every scrapyard. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I totally agree. It's, there's an upside and a downside yeah. to it. And I would like to see blacksmithing, not just bladesmithing, but blacksmithing and real bladesmithing more generally popularized, where people have more knowledge of mm -hmm. it. But there are always those downsides. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I totally agree. I, I love teaching people. I specifically love teaching other young people. 
Um, that's I, I do classes, knife making classes and blacksmithing classes here. Um, and I would say 90% of my students are people from ages 8 to 25, maybe mm -hmm. 30. Um, and I love teaching. I absolutely love teaching people, especially the really young ones, because they just, you know, when you find someone who's really passionate about it, they ju they're just like, yes, this is what yeah. I want to do. This is so fascinating to see something taken from a raw bar um, to a finished product and the sustain, like I mentioned earlier, the sustainability that goes yeah. with that. Yeah. It's, it's a blast. Yeah. Absolute blast. What's, what's a tool that you couldn't part with? A tool that I couldn't part with? could be rephrased in so many different ways. Yeah. What's your most valuable tool? Money-wise, that <laughs> milling machine. <laughs> Functionally, probably that forge. I would say just about all my projects go through that forge at some point. You could get away um, with a block of mm -hmm. something for an anvil. In fact, this hunk of granite behind me back here, it's about 160 pounds, it's a headstone. I got it from a cemetery. I didn't take it from a cemetery. It was given to me. It was um, replaced. It was, it was broken and replaced. It's got a major <laughs> chip on the corner. I think the mowers, someone in landscaping through the cemetery hit the thing, chipped a big chunk out of the corner. They replaced it. This thing was sitting outside the building and I was, that was my first anvil. I was about 13 or 14 and swung into this place and went in and said, hey, is there any chunks of granite I can have? And they said, yep, we have this one. You can take it. So. Yeah, like you were mentioning, you can use a lot of things. I've used that thing. Um, I've used just blocks of steel. I absolutely love forklift forks. I get them from the scrapyard. I cut them on the bandsaw. Um, there's a chunk back there. It's 260 pounds, and that's my striking anvil. It's it's a. It obviously has some more hardness. They have to be pretty springy to be forklift forks, and it's got a definitely got a hardness level that's above mild steel, and you can use a lot of things for an anvil. But yeah, that forge. It's definitely a workhorse for me.